Hi, I'm Brian, and I'm a white male. So we're talking about the lives of hipster saints tonight. For those of you expecting five minutes on the transcendent qualities of hipsters, um, that's not what we're doing. But we will talk about levitation, so don't you worry about that. No, we're going to take an anthropological approach and link certain things we're seeing today in the pop culture to the lives of saints that lived hundreds of years ago. And we could start off kind of in a semi-superficial manner by taking a look at really bad haircuts. Now, I would point out that the saints along the bottom of your screen, at least they committed themselves to lives of celibacy. I'm not sure what's going on up top. Speaking of hair, in traditional iconography, the only adult woman shown with her hair down fully exposed is the rehabilitated harlot, Mary Magdalene. So redheads in the audience, if you're wondering where your reputation came from, it's hundreds of years old. We look at clothing, anti-fashion fashion, simple on the outside, comfortable on the inside, or so I've read on the internet. But let's talk about hipster behavior. Is there no more perfect combination of laziness and self-entitlement than hipster beggars? Back in the sixth century, we had Saint Servulus, a handicapped beggar in Rome, who not only took alms, but he also redistributed alms to those in more need than him kind of like the anti-solipsist, pass it on guy. Now, who hasn't been at a traffic light completely annoyed at a hipster balanced on their fixie bicycle, playing it off casual, but it was all about look at me? Well, hundreds of years ago, there was a saint, Saint Simeon the Stylite, who annoyed people because he lived atop a 10-meter pillar for 37 years. So, of course, spawned a whole school of imitators living on top of their own pillars. But you know hipsters like to get their party on. What better way to waste your 20s and 30s just hitting the chronic and the PBR? St. Augustine wasted his 20s, too, shacked up with his girlfriend and partying. And, of course, he did the first modern tell-all autobiography as well that included the prayer Grant me chastity, but not yet. <laughs> now, we all like our indie music, you know, stripped down melodies and um, facial hair. Well, the melodies don't get any more stripped down than Gregorian chant, and you still get your facial hair. Now, Gregorian chant was promoted by St. Gregory the Great. And when you're like the Pope, you don't have to promote your music by hanging music posters up in coffee shops. You can decree things. And Gregorian chant was atop the charts for 550 years. So yeah, so like, you know, piercings and tats are so ubiquitous and they speak of the, the intersection of self-expression and self-abnegation. And somebody who would recognize that is St. Veronica Giuliani who for 30 years practiced mortification of the flesh with the implements shown here, a very sort of strict discipline. More relationships with the flesh, St. Jerome. You know the four-hour body? This is the 40-year body, where extreme asceticism meets extreme scholarship. And I dare say the mind-body duality is something we all carry around with us. Okay, levitation. St. Joseph of Cupertino, Cupertino, California. This is true. He was known for his blank expressions and his explosive temper. <laughs> All right, it's a little different taxonomy, but like shout out to the emo boys and the way they share their feelings with us to the point of utter exhaustion. Well, that kind of self-expression has its roots actually in the poet St. John of the Cross, The Dark Night of the Soul, where he spoke not only of the passion and the loneliness, but the utter sense of abandonment that we all feel in our existential individualism today. So what I want to suggest is we are in the twilight of desert monotheism, but as we laugh 
about the self-absorbed narcissism of hipsters, let us recognize that there's underlying threads connecting them to remarkable lives lived hundreds of years ago. Thank you very much.